Hello everybody, welcome back. We are continuing our look through the Scream franchise today. We are talking about Scream 3. So I've got my notes, I'm going to get right into it. Right off the bat, this advanced voice changer uh, that we have in this film that can take on different people's voices. I remember at the time thinking like, you know, that's too unbelievable, that's too crazy. Looking back on it now though, this was ahead of its time. This kind of stuff with deep fakes and the kind of pictures and audio and video that people can make that have somewhat convincing results. This this was leading down that path. It was kind of surprising to me, spoiler alert as I go into the fourth one, that they didn't bring that kind of stuff back because it would have been even more uh, present at that time. I have yet to see the fifth one, so maybe something like that will be in play. But, um, yeah, I, I, something that my opinion has changed on over time. Uh, <laughs> my next note says, working from home before it was cool. Uh, because Sydney Prescott in this movie has a job where she's able to work from home. That's also, looking back, much more believable than uh, I would have thought when I saw this movie for the first time. Not that I thought that that was impossible, but... You know, nowadays, we all know how easy that can be. Um, we've got... Uh, okay, I wrote down, I love seeing the actors in this movie playing characters in the movie within the movie that are played by... The, the actual thing I wrote down was love seeing the actors playing actors playing characters. So it's just... It's a very meta thing where we see characters played by actors playing different characters played by different actors as different or as different versions of those characters in this other movie. It, it, I don't know. It's just the kind of stuff that I find amusing. Um, I, that weird Jay and Silent Bob cameo. Man, that has so many implications for the Viewisk universe. And that is a whole other thing for a different video. But man, that's so weird that they put that in here. Um, <laughs> similar to the schools in the last couple movies, I wrote down the movie studio continuing after the death on set. And I wonder, you know, I have experience in schools. I'm a teacher and I've been a student. So, like, I kind of feel like when I say the school would have shut down, I feel like I have experience to make me feel that way. But I'm like, I don't know how that goes with movie sets because I know there are movies where people have died things like The Crow and things like the Amityville Horror movies and I think the Exorcist movies had things happen also and like there are productions that have people die and they don't necessarily get stopped and at the time of recording this this whole thing that has gone on with the Rust movie and Alec Baldwin and the cinematographer getting shot I don't know it's it just it kind of just takes me out of the movie when things that I would think should warrant a shutdown of something, whether that be a school or a movie production, are still going. And it's just one of those things where characters in movies don't act like real people. Um, and so I, I, I just feel like if things were treated more realistically, that would keep me engaged in the movie uh, more. But it's like the movie needs those things to happen a certain way. So just takes me out of the movie a little bit. Not a big, big deal. Um, I wrote down a note that says, who answers other people's phones? I don't remember the scene in question. And I don't remember who answered the phone. This isn't the one in college. Um, but yeah, at some point, somebody answers someone else's phone. Which is just weird to me. Okay, and then my next note says dream sequences. Why did it have to be dream sequences? So I I hate it when movies put in dream sequences for like a cheap scare or something because then that brings into question everything else in the movie, right? Because if you are going to put those things in your movie, then that sets it up such that anything in the movie could have been a dream sequence, right? Now, movies that are 
about a character's inability to distinguish between real life and fiction or dream sequences or visions or whatever. Um, you know, something like uh, Last Night in Soho comes to mind. Like, movies were like, that's important. I'm, I'm totally on board with it. But it just feels really lazy to do it for a cheap scare. And then people like me that think way too much about these kind of things and try to dissect things were like, well, what, the, what, if, what if this thing that happened, we thought happened, didn't actually happen? And, like, I didn't go down any rabbit holes in this. I just, that's just a pet peeve of mine when movies do that without an actual narrative purpose other than, you know, a surprise scare. Uh, at one point, I just started writing down actors that were in this that I had forgotten, like Patrick Dempsey and Patrick Warburton. I pronounced that wrong. Warburton. Patrick Warburton. I don't know how to say that. I feel like I'm saying it wrong. Two different Patricks. That's weird. Um, Carrie Fisher. I just like people that I had no memory of being in these movies. Um, then I wrote uh, Fighting with Props. That was really funny. So there's a lot of stuff that like doing um, this meta kind of movie on a film set but that seems in so many ways realistic to the characters in there. So there's a scene where they're fighting with all these props that obviously aren't going to hurt the killer. That was kind of funny. Um, I wrote an overly complicated backstory because at this point it's just the links that they're going to to tie the whole thing together to Sydney seems a bit far-reaching. And the idea that this small-town girl left for a while... And came back. That I'm fine with. But the fact that nobody knew about it. Not the police. Not her family. Not anyone. Like. It's getting a little out there for me. Um, and it's. That, like all these little things piling up. Are the reasons that. I don't like the third film. As much as I like the first and second film. I don't think it's bad. I think I used to dislike it more. And I think it's gotten better over time. Um with some of the things that I've said before, but overall it just seems like they're really pushing stuff to the limit, um, in this third installment. Uh, I wrote down one killer. So this is the first time that we only have one killer in the franchise. Usually it's two. Oh, what else do we have? Randy's secret sister. Again, that's just the only thing that it's like, well, we've established this thing that we have in these movies, but we killed that guy. And we already had the tape from him, or not the tape. We've already um, had his death, so we can't have him anymore. So what are we going to do now? Oh, he's had, got a sister that nobody's ever mentioned before. You know, it's just like, again, reaching a little bit too far in too many instances for me to let them all slide. Um, I wrote down at one point, nice shot, Dewey. Um, which I think was just, he had a really far shot and he took it quick and he landed it. Um, I think he was like on top of a hill and the, the killer was attacking Gale and he hit, he shot him and the killer dropped and like rolled under the SUV. And I didn't think much of it at the time. I just wrote nice shot, Dewey, cause that's a good shot. But then I think it's in the fourth movie where he just cannot hit the killer for nothing. Um, so we'll come back to that. In that video. Uh, what else? I have Chase Through Fake Houses. So again, this is a really clever thing that they did. Where they have these sets that look like houses. And some of the rooms are complete. And some of them, you go through a door and there's no floor there. Like, that is really interesting. That is really clever. I really wish there would have been more neat things. Neat, clever things like that in this movie. And less far you know, random backstory convolution that I don't like because there are parts of this movie that I do really like and that I think are really neat and clever. <laughs> I wrote cell phones are uh, finally more common um, and they use that for the plot. So it's just, again, in my video for the first one, I laugh about people who are like, why do you have a cell phone? And obviously looking back now, that's silly, but that progresses with these movies, so that's kind of interesting. Um, then I wrote, why do they keep splitting up? So I think this must have been 
I, it's been a while since I watched this and took my notes. I'm trying to remember back. This must have been at like the producer's house, right? And they, they split up and they go their separate ways. And I'm like, why? Why would you do that? You, right? You guys are supposed to, this meta series is supposed to know the rules of the horror movies. Why do you keep breaking the rules? Uh, then I wrote Secret Brother. So just like Randy had a surprise sister. Now I've got the Secret Brother. Uh, not a fan of it. Um, and then we get this scene at the end where Sydney's back in her house. I think someone else is there with her. Um, and she comes in from like a run or something. And yeah, someone's there because they're gonna, like, gonna watch a movie or something. I don't, it's been a, a while since I saw it. And she goes and she closes the door. I can't remember if she sets the alarm or not, right? But she goes and she does something and then she turns around and the door has opened. And she just leaves it and turns around. And it's, I get what they're going for. It's supposed to be this big moment of like, I'm not going to let my life be run by fear anymore. I'm not going to be afraid anymore, right? I'm just going to, but like, why would you leave the door to your house open? That's just a sign from killers trying to get you, which there's not at that time. But like, you're going to get critters in there. You're going to, you know, I don't know what your AC bills are. Like, why leave a door to your house? That's just, it's so stupid. And because we saw how intense she was before with the multiple locks and the alarm system and all this stuff, there are other ways you can show that, right? I don't remember if they established like an exterior gate or something, but if you had done that, just have her come back in and like make a point to show a shot where she doesn't close that gate, right? And then have her come in the house and you can make a point to show her closing the door, but not doing all the different locks, not doing the alarm. And you can get that same uh, feeling across without having this totally stupid thing of she just leaves her front door open. Ends on a sour note. Ends on a sour note. So, a lot of a lot of stuff going on in this movie. I really like the meta stuff. I really like the things that have to do with the movies within the movie. The actors playing these other characters in the movie. That you know, the two Gail Weathers is is hilarious. There's a lot of good stuff that comes from that. And the technology advancement, I have grown to appreciate more. But the convolution with the backstories of the mom's secret life and these secret siblings that these characters have it's just a little bit too much for me to appreciate as much as the first two i don't hate it i wouldn't say that i dislike it i would just say that it's not as strong as the first two so those are my thoughts on screen three let me know your thoughts in the comments below but that's all that i've got to say thank you for watching have a good day